It's my honor and privilege to share with you today the concluding message of this Bridal Awakening Conference. I'm so grateful for you being here and for taking the time to seek the Lord together with us so we might all know more fully the purposes of God during the season and be encouraged how the Lord is very much leading us somewhere beautiful together. The road ahead was never going to be easy, but oh, how glorious the final destination. I want to thank Phoebe and I4K for allowing us to partner with you again this year. And thank you to all those who have worked so hard to make this conference possible. May the Lord bless you richly. In this message, I want to give some prophetic direction and frame what we see happening around the world today into a bridal context. Because I've always found looking through the bridal lens is the best way to interpret the times and seasons. So let's begin with Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. And he shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change times and law. And power shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half the time. The context here in this familiar passage is one of a legal setting because this scripture is part of a broader passage in Daniel which features a courtroom and the transfer of power and kingdoms given over to Jesus as the Son of Man and to the saints at the end of the age. Satan will think to change the times and law, but he must attempt this reset in the courts of heaven. Because that's what the context of this scripture is. There's a lot of talk today about a dark agenda global reset. But if the enemy is granted such a reset, it will be because he has successfully presented his case in these courts. It is a legal issue. The laws and decrees in heaven governs the times and seasons upon the earth. Now, of course, all of these are subject to God himself, who Daniel also tells us is the one who changes times and seasons. He removes and establishes kings. Daniel 2.21 tells us that. But when the enemy can establish a legal right in a sphere of society, He can establish a stronghold there, a beachhead, from which further assaults can be launched, thereby advancing his kingdom. These strongholds are represented by the gates. Biblically, the gates always represent the seat of authority and stronghold for a region or a city. Whoever possessed the gates controlled the territory. It should come as no surprise the enemy is looking for a reset because he will do all he can to undermine, hinder, and frustrate the plan and purpose of God. But let me be clear. When talking of changing times and laws, this will not extend to his final demise or the coming of the day of the Lord. Oh no. That day has been fixed by the Father, and even during the great tribulation, when Satan's kingdom shall be at its fiercest and most virulent, even then, the number of those days will be cut short. Matthew 24, verse 22. Cut short here, meaning to amputate or to curtail. Satan's kingdom will be cut short. Hallelujah. Ultimately, he will try to wreak as much devastation as he can within the time assigned. 
in this sense, changing times and laws pertains to what he is able to do during the time he has remaining. This is the reset we hear about, changing the times and laws in the courts of heaven so his dark agenda can be enforced. Since the gates are the beachhead for further advance, they form a central part of the spiritual battle taking place over the nations right now. Whilst the gates can be defended, the enemy can remain in power. Hence, for the enemy to sustain control in a region or a territory or nation, these gates must not be taken. Now, here's the question to ask. Is there anyone who is able to do that, to take the gates of the enemy? Is there anyone who is able to dispossess the enemy from the gate? Well, here's what Genesis 24 verses 58 to 60 says. They called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, O oh, our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. I love this passage. I've taught this favorite passage of mine many times over the years, how Rebecca represents the bride. And I normally finish the message with her response where she says, yes, I will go. This demonstrates her acceptance of the wedding proposal that was brought to her by Eliezer when he was sent by Abraham on the commission to find a bride for his son, Isaac. But the story doesn't end there. Because if we continue reading, we find on the basis of her betrothal, Rebecca receives a blessing for her descendants to possess the gates of those who hate them. Now, here's the point I'm making. If we accept Rebecca is a type or foreshadow of the bride, we can see how the blessing she received has been passed down to those who are spiritually identified with her as the bride to possess the gates. The bride poses a great threat, therefore, to Satan's schemes and global reset, and therefore the enemy will try to restrain her. At this time, among the nations around the world, we are witnessing in the physical realm a manifestation of what is taking place in the spiritual realm. If we stop and consider the characteristics exhibited by the world governments right now, there are visible patterns we can identify that reveal something of what is taking place in the spirit. Lockdown, social distancing, Vaccine passports are all terms that we know well. We are witnessing a limitation on what people can and cannot do, tighter controls at the border, restrictions of personal freedoms. All these current global issues are hotly debated and causing much divide. Hmm. Of course, I understand and support the need to mitigate the dreadful toll on life and spread of the coronavirus. But there is so much more at play here than what we see with our physical eye and hear through the media. If increasing restraint is clearly visible in the natural realm, what does that tell us about the spiritual realm? Yes, there is a restraint being imposed by the enemy. But there is also a restraint sanctioned by the Lord. And the two are very different. They are not the same. And when I say restraint, I'm not referring to the manifestation that we see in the natural realm. But what's taking place in the spirit? That's what we're talking about here. 
The enemy seeks to impose restraint to cause a spiritual lockdown. But the Lord uses restraint as a means to elevate us higher into greater freedom and authority. Hallelujah. The Lord's reset is to provide the opportunity for the bride to ascend to a higher consciousness of who she is and to open her eyes to behold a greater vision of who God is for her. <laughs> wow. I don't know if you caught that. It was deep, so I'll, I'll say it again just to bed it down a little deeper. The enemy seeks to impose restraint to cause a spiritual lockdown. But the Lord uses restraint as a means to elevate us higher into greater freedom and authority. The Lord's reset is to provide the opportunity for us, the bride, to ascend to a higher consciousness of who we are and to open our eyes to behold a greater vision of who God is. It is so, so important for us to understand this principle of restraint because godly restraint embraced by the bride will enable and empower her to cast off the shackles of demonic restraint. Let me put it like this. In order for the bride to exercise restraint over her enemies, she must first be given the opportunity to exercise restraint over herself. It's why for over a year there has been a sila, a divine restraint imposed by the Lord to provide the opportunity for the bride to ascend higher through being still, through knowing God, through abiding, coming back to first love, setting aside the mundane duties of the kitchen to sit a while like Mary, listening to Jesus by his feet, but oh, gazing upon his beautiful face. Satan wants to restrain the bride. Why? Because if we have seen, she can hold him back at the gate. He has no authority to do this whilst she is restrained by God. So God is restraining her. How? With a vision of who he is for her and who she is in him. Without this vision, we will cast off restraint and therefore forfeit our authority to hold the enemy at the gate. Proverbs 29 verse 18 is familiar and it says this, where there is no vision, prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. No vision, no restraint, no vision, and we will perish. Let's call this the principle of two-sided restraint. We are either restrained by God, which comes through prophetic vision, or we are restrained by the enemy. We see this principle many times in Scripture. I don't have time to teach on them all now, but a couple of examples include Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They violated God's restraint by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Consequently, Satan was able to restrain them. There was Samson restrained by God to be a Nazarite, which meant his hair must not be cut. But when that restraint was violated, his enemy cut his hair, and he not only lost his strength, but his vision also. Now, he was the one being restrained by the bonds of his adversaries. The Lord is saying, come up away with me. Come away with me. I want to show you my glory. 
I want to show you a picture, a vision of the bride. Our vision determines our restraint. And our restraint determines our authority. There are different kinds of restraints which come with different kinds of authority. For Adam and Eve, it was don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For Samson, it was don't let your hair be cut. If we want authority to dispossess the gates of our enemies, then we need a vision of the bride so that we can live with bridal restraint and therefore operate with bridal authority. One of the greatest and most difficult areas to exercise restraint is over the tongue. <laughs> James writes powerfully when he says, no human being can control the tongue. It is a restless evil full of poison. James 3 verse 8. Or how about the restraint needed to be truly, truly still? Being still lies at the heart of knowing God, and yet our common experience is that it's something we continually struggle to do. But it is here we must all abide, none least than those called into prophetic ministry. It is restraint over the tongue in the life of the prophet that qualifies them to speak on God's behalf. Because the vessel to be used must be set apart as holy. If by the tongue a prophet should speak for God, then the prophet must exercise restraint over it also. Therefore a prophet should be slow to speak and quick to listen. The Lord issues a restraining order. A restraining order over the tongue of the prophet that they may issue. A restraining order over their adversaries. The verse, the spirit of prophets are subject to the control of prophets, demonstrates this well. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 32. Well, let's look at the prophet Elijah and see this principle in action. One of the things Elijah is most known for is the account on Mount Carmel. Surely this was a reset on numerous levels. The people were challenged. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then serve him. But if Baal, then follow him. 1 Kings 18.21 But on that day, there was also a reset in the prophetic, or should I say the false prophetic. Have you ever wondered why Baal never showed up to the incantations and lacerations of his exhausted and self-mutilating prophets? Was he not real? Yeah, of course he was real. Then did his prophets not know how he could be summoned? Yes, I believe they knew full well the means in which Baal could be invoked. Then why is it that Baal never showed up on that fateful day? I'm sure he would have relished the opportunity to manifest and further secure the nation's belief in him. After all, this was a major embarrassment, a power struggle of the highest order. If nothing else, at least Baal or one of his prophets would try to kill Elijah, this troubler of Israel. But there was none of it. I believe it was because there was a divine restraining order in place which bound the enemy from trespassing over the boundaries imposed. It was because of who Elijah was in the secret place that qualified him to be used by God in the public arena. For three and a half years, he'd been hidden away by God and fed by God so he could be used for one day to reveal God to the nation. For three and a half years, Elijah lived in restraint so that he could exercise restraint over 
his enemies. Oh, God. How we need to learn this lesson well. How we need to learn this lesson of restraint within the restraints of holiness, within the restraints of the bridal vision. Especially those called into prophetic ministry. It's less about what you say and more about who you are. Before the battle can be won for the nation, it must first be won in the private life of the prophet. Enough spiel and rhetoric, enough political opinion and heresy, enough whitewashing over the walls of Babylon. It's time to come out of Babylon. I tell you, Jesus is coming soon and we need to be ready. It's time to get dressed for the wedding. Malachi 4 verse 5 and 6 reads, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Where are the Elijahs today? Who are the Elijahs today? We talk of the Elijah generation, but do not think that all prophets today form part of this elite company. It is not so. Yes, the Lord will send the spirit of Elijah again before the coming of the Lord, just as he did on Jesus' first coming, to manifest it through the life and the ministry of John the Baptist. But who they are will be evident more by their lifestyle than by their words. Did not be deceived by the seeming depth of their revelation, their elaborate words, or their renown. Rather, look to the heart as always, and weigh and discern in the spirit what has been spoken. I believe the Elijahs of today are those who, like the Elijah of old, will be used by the Lord to hold back the ruling powers and authorities operating over the nations, to provide an opportunity for the people to repent. Oh God, this is the Elijahs that God is looking for. Those who would live that life of restraint. Those who he can use to stand in the gap. Those who by their lifestyle are able to there exercise restraint over the nation, over the powers, the rulers that roll over the nation that provide an opportunity for the nation to come into salvation before God. This indeed, is it not a great commission? This mantle fits the bride beautifully. She is a prophetess in the spirit of Elijah and she is able to turn back the battle at the gate. Isaiah 28, verse 6. <clears throat> Did you know that where there is an Elijah, there's also a Jezebel? This ancient rivalry between these two enemies didn't end in the Old Testament. It can also be seen between John the Baptist and Herodias, who at the opportune time had John imprisoned and beheaded. Make no mistake, if the spirit of Elijah is here today, then so also is the spirit of Jezebel. The good news is that there is hope. Hallelujah. For certainly there is an anointing reserved for the bride, commissioning her to pick up Elijah's mantle and exercise authority at the gate so her enemies are restrained and thrown down. Let's see how this reign of Jezebel was finally ended in 2 Kings chapter 9 verses 30 to 34. Now when Jehu had come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head. Oh, how beautiful she must have looked that day. And she looked through the window. Then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? 
And he looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? Who is on my side? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him. Then he said to them, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. And when he'd gone in, he ate and drank. Then he said, Go now, see to this accursed woman, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. Wow. Can you see what's just happened here? Jehu is anointed as king over Israel. And he's instructed to avenge on Jezebel the blood of the prophets and the servants of the Lord. 2 Kings 9 verse 7. His anointing, Jehu's anointing can be traced back to Elisha and therefore to Elijah. Jehu was operating, if you like, with the, the anointing and the spirit of Elijah. And so Jehu sets out for Jezreel. And Jezebel prepares to meet him by beautifying herself. Now, look at where her demise came. It says that Jehu entered the gate. It was there Jezebel called down and Jehu called for those on his side to throw her down. So Jezebel was cast down and her blood splattered everywhere. In verse 33, we read how Jehu trampled her underfoot. And then afterwards, after she'd been thrown down, there at the gate, he went in, ate, and he drank. I hope you catch this. It was at the gate where Jezebel was thrown down. It is at the gate where the bride can dispossess her enemies, where she can exercise a restraining order over the ruling spirits in a territory or nation and trample her adversary underfoot. Oh, wow. What authority is that? But it's understand it is the authority given to the spiritual descendants of Rebecca, who is the bride. Okay. Let's move on and look at Revelation 11 verses 3 to 6. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These two have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Whoever these two witnesses are is still a matter of debate, although their office as prophets is clear. And we can see similarities between these two prophets and Moses and Elijah. Power to prevent rain for three and a half years? Well, who does that sound like? Turning the waters to blood and striking the earth with all plagues. Isn't this a likeness to Moses? Both Moses and Elijah are venerated in Scripture. Both receive a special mention in Malachi chapter 4 concerning the day of the Lord. And both appear alongside Jesus at his transfiguration. We've looked a little at Elijah. Are there lessons we can learn from Moses in this divine reset? The Bible says the Lord made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. Psalm 103 verse 7. There's a difference between the two. The acts of God manifest in what he does, but his ways reveal why he does them. His acts are visible, but his ways are not so easily discerned. God's acts are continually changing, even though his acts may seem random and 
inexplicable at times, his ways are entirely consistent with his nature, with who he is. You can always expect God to be true to who he is. The Lord sings over us. I am the Lord and I change not. Malachi 3 verse 6. The problem is knowing God's acts are not enough to sustain us. We must also know him for who he is, not his acts alone. Even though the Israelites, they had a front row demonstration of the acts of God, whether the plagues in Egypt, their escape through the Red Sea, or the pillar of fire and of cloud, the Lord was about to depart from them. Even though they'd witnessed his acts, why is the presence of God about to leave? This is what Exodus 33 tells us in verses 2 and 3. The Lord says, I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Oh, wow. Did you notice something very important here? The Lord would fulfill his promise to give them the land of their own as he promised their forefathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And even here in, in Exodus 33, he's still going to fulfill that promise. But the difference is that he would not be among them. Instead, his angel would go ahead of them. Now, isn't that interesting? It is possible to arrive into the promises of God without the presence of God. Let me say that again. It is possible to arrive into the promises of God without the presence of God. To benefit from his acts, but still not know his ways. The church today may find itself also in the same position. There may be evidence, yes, of the acts of God displaying in the church, and we may all rejoice, but it does not mean that the presence of God led them to where they are today. We must be careful on this point. Now, herein lies the prophetic reset, I believe, that is coming. The role of the prophet is to look beyond the veil of God's acts, not what he will do, but who he is. That look beyond the veil of his acts and search for his heart. Search for his heart. Search for his heart. Search for his heart in order to know his ways. The prophetic ministry will be less about what he will do and so much more about who he is. Less foretelling and more foretelling, bringing God himself to the people, revealing his heart for them. This is the reset I mentioned earlier in my message to help the bride. Let the prophet help the bride. Let her help her to ascend to a higher consciousness of who she is and to open her eyes to behold a greater vision of who the Lord is for her. This prophetic heart is exactly what we see displayed in Moses. Hear his appeal to the Lord in Exodus 33, verses 13 to 15. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way. 
Show me your way, O oh God. If I have found favor in your sight, then show me your way that I might know you. Lord, show us your ways. This is Moses' cry. And the Lord said to him, My presence will go with you. And I, I will give you rest. Oh, how we need the rest of God at this time. His presence among his people. Why? Because his people desire his presence more than his promises. They desire his ways more than his acts. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not. Do not bring us up from here, O oh God. Lord, you may take us to where our hearts have been set, but Lord, if you're not there, what is the point? If your presence is not with us, O oh God, what will others think and see? There's a really interesting detail here. Moses' first appeal wasn't for the Lord's presence to go with them. We so often think that, but no. It wasn't for his presence to go with him. It was that he might know him. He was saying, don't show me where to go. Don't show us where to go. Tell us, oh God, who you are. Don't give us direction, oh God, if you're not there. Don't tell us where to go. Show us who you are. Can you hear the cry of Moses? Can you hear and feel his pain? Can you feel the spirit of Moses today in the hearts of his people longing for his ways more than they do his acts? It's more about our desire for God rather than direction from God. It reminds me of Psalm 84 verse 10. It says, better is one day in your cause than a thousand elsewhere. So the Lord reassured Moses, saying, Moses, don't worry. My presence will go with you. Don't worry. I will give you rest. Wow. What a beautiful example of how to pray that we are given here. Seeking his face and not his hands. Desiring his presence more than his promises. After all, if we as his bride do not prioritize our intimacy and desire to know him above where he may be leading us or where we may be headed, then we may arrive at our destination that we've set our hopes upon only to find that the Lord himself has departed from our midst. In 2016, I was asked to attend a conference at Westminster, London to declare the time of the bride for the UK. This was an awesome privilege that I took very seriously. And the Lord granted the grace to fast for 40 days, leading right up to the day of the conference. <laughs> wow. I knew I was spiritually pregnant and felt the weight of what I was carrying, and I was ready to deliver. <laughs> Things didn't quite go as I'd expected that day. But a wonderful time of prayers of repentance. And as different ministers came to speak one after the other, I was keeping a close eye on time, which was quickly disappearing. And now there were only a few minutes left. And I was disturbed because I needed to birth what I was carrying. And yet the delivery room was closing. Wow. But praise God. I also felt his peace and reassurance. This, this declaration for his bride would still be made in some other place and time. With a few minutes to spare, I was graciously asked if I wanted to come up to the pulpit and make the declaration. I declined as I, I knew by then the Lord had something else in mind. I'd asked Howard to come with me to the conference to, to blow the chauffeur, but 
But now I was walking with him back to Westminster Tube Station for him to begin his journey back home to Cornwall. And as we walk past Big Ben, that's right there, Big Ben on Westminster, on Westminster Bridge, that's where we were. That's when the spiritual waters broke. Oh, hallelujah. And the contractions began. This was to be the place to deliver. Right outside Big Ben, the symbol of time in the UK, which is GMT, and the world senses time by GMT. Right here, a convergence in the spirit and the natural realms around time. And Howard and I, we were right in the middle of it, representing the bride and, and who she was, exercising in bridal authority. So we blew the chauffeur. And we prophesied on Westminster Bridge for a recalibration of time. That the nation and nations would come into alignment with the times and the seasons of God. And declare the time of the bride to be released. And wow, that was a precious time. And as we were prophesying and praying, there were two others who were there and and they've been there at the meeting during the day. And as we opened our eyes and we saw them, and the Lord says, by two or three witnesses, it shall be established. Ever since then, it is something that Howard and I have been privileged to be able to do in different nations, in different places that we have been. It's why Big Ben has been used as part of the graphic for this conference because prophetically it represents what took place there as a declaration of the time of the bride among the nations. Now I shared that to say this. Recently, while preparing for the G7 summit assignment, we received that I heard the Lord say, my bride is the timekeeper. My bride is the timekeeper. I understood a little of this through what happened previously at Big Ben, but there was more the Lord wanted to download. There's a part in every clock called the governor, and it's there to regulate the balance and flow of the internal mechanisms so the clock is able to keep time. The Lord is saying, I am the governor and I set the times and season, yet I partner with my bride as my time keeper. When my bride keeps in time with me, she sets the time and the tempo for the nation. The Lord's saying, my bride is my time keeper. When she keeps in time with me, she sets the time and the tempo for the nation. Let me ask you a question. How do you know if your watch or your clock is telling you the right time? But it has to be compared and recalibrated to another time reading somewhere else that you know is correct and reliable. Beloved, that's what we've been called to do. To set the time and the tempo for the nations according to the time in heaven. Hallelujah. We are his timekeepers, but for us to be his timekeepers, our hearts must first be healed and reset. Oh, won't you leave the relentless rhythm of this world and its empty promises? Won't you rekindle the flame of passion for your kinsman, redeemer. Even now, even now I can hear the song of the Lord singing over his bride. Can you hear it too? Amongst all the commotion, the tumult of the nations, can you hear? Can you hear the voice of the Lord singing the song? singing over you the song of the Lord, singing over us today. His deep calling to deep. His voice, if you could hear his voice of the bridegroom, he's calling you. 
He's drawing you deeper into him at this time. In Song of Songs, it mentions three times, do not stir up or awaken love before he pleases. Well, guess what? It pleases the bridegroom to stir up and awaken love in you. (laughs) Wow. It pleases him. It's time. It's time to be romance for love and desire to be quickened and awakened within us. It's time to be unraveled by his amazing love, restored and washed by his love, healed and quickened by his love. And this divine reset, it is about love. The Lord is romancing his bride. Let's be encouraged to go deeper and higher into his presence than we've ever been before, knowing that it is him who is drawing us there. Let's allow his love to heal and to reset our hearts and our minds to be one with his. Our adversary will try to restrain us but will fail at every attempt whilst we hold true to the vision of the bride. It's time for that upgrade into our bridal identity. Only she is able to turn back the battle at the gate. Only she is able to wield the full measure of the authority of Christ. The Lord remains the hope of the nations and is calling his bride to make battle and to make him known and to prepare the way for his coming. He is calling her as his timekeeper to set the time and tempo for the nations, anointing her in the spirit of Elijah to stand in the gap, holding back the darkness so people still have time to repent and be saved. Like Moses with a passion to see his glory. He is calling her to contend for his presence. To contend for his presence among his people. This will not be a battle of words, but of power. Not from the ingenuity of man, but in humility. And apparent weakness, there the Lord shall be. The Lord reigns. He rules. His voice breaks the cedars. He sits enthroned and the flood is king forever. The battle may look to take place in the public arena, but its victory will be secured in the secret place of intimacy with the Lord. And in his secret council, there in the imperceptible and unexpected places there, we shall meet the Lord in his secret counsel. I call forth the bride to arise among the nations of the world. Awake, arise, come forth. Hear the word of the Lord spoken over you and the song he is singing over his bride. Do not be afraid. The Lord of hosts will fight for you. He is zealous for you as a husband for his beloved. Wherever you are right now, as you're hearing this message, I ask the Holy Spirit to quicken you to quicken you in the inner depths of who you are, of your understanding, and let the mind that is in Christ be in you also. I pray that your spiritual eyes be open to the full measure of your highest identity. You are your heavenly Father's child, yes, but you have come to the Father's house to grow and be mature and capable of love, ready for that love and oneness with his Son through a marriage relationship. Let the bride in you awake, awake, arise, I call forth the bride. Let your conscious mind awaken to a higher revelation of who God is for you 
and who you are in him. There is so much more you have yet to understand. Where you are now is not your final destination. The Holy Spirit has come to take you on a journey to the bridegroom. And the question remains, will you go? Will you forsake all others and renew your vows at the altar today? I want to stand with you right now and contend for your nation. Let's agree together as the bride, all of us listening to this message as the Lord's timekeepers. We decree and we declare that the time of our nations be aligned into the times and laws and seasons of heaven. As Elijah on Mount Carmel, we call our nations to repentance. As the bride, we exercise our authority to dispossess our enemies and to turn back the battle at the gates. We repent for the sins of our nation and we ask for the blood of Jesus to be applied against the heavenly record of our sins and the accusations of our adversary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want to finish with this prayer together. Come as the Alpha and Omega, for in you is the beginning and the end of all things. Come to finish your new creation, that we might be pure and spotless. As a bride beautifully dressed for her husband, come as the root and the offspring of David. Let earth receive her king. Come for the nations of this world are yours and the nations your inheritance. You alone are worthy to be crowned with many crowns. You alone are worthy to receive all glory and honor and blessing. Come as the bright morning star, for you are the promise of a new day. We have heard the Holy Spirit within us cry, come. And we've heard you say, I am coming soon. So we say, amen. Even so, come, Lord. Jesus, come, Lord, come. Lord, in a world that is torn apart by pain, fear, and devastation, oh, Lord, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. This is your reset to quicken us, to raise us up, to give us a vision of who you are for us and who we are in you.